Hello, everybody, and welcome to our post reading week chapter 19 pensions and chapter 20 earnings per share debrief video based off of your great questions. I will um, delve into the number one FAQ for chapter 19, which was all about the CPA way. Uh, and most of those were, well, about half of those were about uh, the specific. 9% rate within the case uh, in the solution and where did it come from? So I will make sure to talk about that very, very shortly. I'm going to run through a few items, a few housekeeping items, uh, as well as some few FYIs for the future. Talk about your other FAQs for chapter 19. And then I'll, I'll flip to another clip where I'll be discussing the CPA way for chapter 19 and walking through it step by step. And then I'll be doing the FAQs for chapter 20. So um, these were just submitted and finalized last night. I am so, so, so pleased that we had a high number of people, like almost, I think we missed six people. And this is really exciting to me because um, at this point with your drop one, um, many people were in a position where they could have not submitted this and they did. So kudos to you. That means that the uh, exam that we're writing in just a, a little way, so um, in just a few, few moments, about a week and two days, if you're watching this when this comes out on November 24th, um, kudos to you. All right, so uh, I wanna say thank you. A number of you um, asked or said, hey, I hope you had a good reading week. I uh, hope you were doing well. So yeah, um, I'll give you a little bit of a brief update to what, what we were going to do. Um, went for brunch in the valley. So I met up with one of my friends. He used to live in Calgary uh, and his partner. And that was amazing. And then um, because it was getting to be really close to two o'clock on that Saturday, and one of uh, your classmates in another class and one of my former students, uh, Terry, was in a competition. So we rushed, rushed back to my friend's house and we watched Terry and we watched him hit all of his lifts. So I'll put a picture on the screen and just so, so happy. Um, love staying in touch with you guys. Love knowing what's going on in your life. And I love that um, you get to share a bit of that with me. So kudos uh, to Terry. Uh, <laughs> and um, kudos to you all. Let me know what you've been up to and um, only with permission, don't worry. <laughs> I spoke to Terry about this before putting that picture, uh, but I'm, I'm really proud of you guys and, and that's what's part of it being part of our uh, Dow Tigers, part of our accounting huddle is that we, we know that accounting doesn't happen in you know, in, in one area that we have other things in our lives and we should really celebrate that. Okay, um, what else? So when for brunch, did a bunch of yoga, um, reading break is a uh, number of you, um, when you emailed me, you were really nice and you were like, oh, is this, I'm sorry if I'm interrupting you during your break. No, 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 it's, it's a break for students and it's a break to like catch up, um, mostly for students. Um, for, for profs, uh, it's a time when everybody fills your scheduled meetings. So it, I had a great um, break, the, the week was great. Um, I got a lot of meetings done and um, they were all really, really good meetings and all initiatives uh, that support, support students in one way or another and that I'm happy to be a part of. So I had a great break. Uh, <laughs> and um, gosh, I would be uh, remiss if I didn't mention that uh, during your weekly videos, I love like the little extra things that you guys throw in. So for example, I got to meet Sully, who looked like the best study buddy ever. And um, I can see, <laughs> I can visually see that we have a number of people supporting Movember. So kudos uh, <laughs> to you all. Alrighty. Uh, I have posted the review class in uh, our calendar. That is also going to be part of the uh, news post that I post today and uh, announcing this video. So that is going to be our review class on Teams for next Monday. 
And let us dig into these FAQs. Um, oh, but first, I just want to put, I'll put the link in the description, but a few of you said that you actually like my recommendations. Um, and those of you who didn't say anything either, I'm just gonna assume you haven't seen them or maybe you dislike them. If so, ignore in the next like 30 seconds. Uh, I want, I'm gonna be posting uh, Tim Urban's TED Talk on procrastination. <laughs> and I have to say, I love this one and it's, um, I am definitely guilty. If you look at your own like, energy cycles, I love starting new projects. I love planning new projects. I love, you know, doing things. Um, but there hits the point where it's like 85 to 95% of the way done. And part of me is like, well, it's going good. Like why, <laughs> you know, if just put the, keep the gas on, um, you know, and that's when my own procrastination tends to creep up. I've noticed, not with all things, um, but definitely if I do have a point to procrastinate, it's either initially starting a project, in which case maybe it indicates it's not the best project for me and I'll have to, you know, pick better next time or that like 85 uh or you know like 80 to 95 percent you know that <laughs> the, <laughs> so i'm gonna post it down below uh liked it let me know what you thought send me an email make a comment uh keep it nice and yeah we'll uh, go from there all right so before we dig into the most faq faqs uh for chapter 19 i'll go over uh, a few of the ones that came up a couple other times so DBO. A uh, number of you um, have said, hey, I get it. I get why there's some accounts on the balance sheet. I get why there's some accounts off the balance sheet. And um, well, first off, like kudos, kudos, because that is not easy stuff. I'm actually going to just pause it and bring it up for, so I'm just talking about it to the screen. Okay, so here we go. So a number of you asked, hey, can this DBO ever be to zero? Oh, I mean, this, so these are our off balance sheet accounts, the DBO, our defined benefit obligation and our plan assets. And then from this, this is our on balance sheet accounts, our pension expense and our income statement, our OCI if we are in IFRS, our cash, and then our net defined benefit liability or net debt Defi net, for me, a uh, defined benefit asset. So this net DBA, DBL, is a sum of the DBO, which is a negative because it's a liability, past, present, future. Uh, we owe people money in the future, these future retirees, based off of a past event, we hired them, um, and they had this agreement in their contract, in their employment contract, and it represents a present obligation that we can't get out of. So that's our liability. Um, and then this is, you know, our liability determined by actuaries. And then our plan assets. So each year, each month, each time, uh, we send money, we the company send money to the plan assets. The employee might send money to the plan assets as well. And they're held by a third party. Okay, so then the net of this negative and this positive equal the net DBL DBA. So somebody asked, hey, can this DBO ever be zero? So I would ask you, <laughs> uh, could there ever be a time when the DBO would be zero? Sure, if we no longer had a liability. And if we no longer had a liability, the one kind of easier uh, time or instance that kind of comes to mind is when uh, we no longer have a DB pension. So we may have a case where we no longer have a DB pension. Um, everybody has uh, retired and is no longer receiving benefits. So, you know, retired and died or uh, or they agreed to no longer uh, receive any pension money or maybe, <clears throat> excuse me, the pension was in such dire straits. They're like, hey, cool, we have like five years left of pension. Um, they took a lump sum payout in cash for the rest of it after the five years. Um, their new agreement, you know, was done. So there's no longer a liability on that part. And then there might still be some plan assets left. So <clears throat> yeah, this DBO, it could be at one point, at some point zero, if there was no longer a liability, uh, you know, that would be, that would be absolutely um, the case. And but it would take a while to get there. Let me give you an instance. So I worked at ACO back in Calgary, big, 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 huge, 
uh, billions of dollars uh, in, oh, I'm going to get it wrong, but they had a D, uh, DB pension. And then in, I believe it was the mid 90s, so well before I went there, uh, they uh, offered to people to give them a buyout and to switch to a DC, a defined contribution pension plan. So give them a buyout or give them lump sums or um, sorry, a buyout, meaning they take like a bigger portion of the defined benefit, you know, present value and put it into their defined contribution pension plan. Um, there's some other things. So while we've been talking a lot about why people like to find benefit, hey, the risk is on the company. Um, the other the other thing is you have to stay with the company, like to really make it worth it. So uh, I have a DB pension at Dow right now. So I'm very fortunate in the sense that it's it's something unique to very few sectors, uh, and even within education, um, relatively <clears throat> excuse me unique. So it really only pays off if. <laughs> Uh, the people investing our money know know what they're doing and that I stay until retirement and that uh, the formula within there, which I did check, it's it's pretty good, um, is is reflective um, of like the last few years of your average working income. So but what people don't necessarily understand is that if you're going to leave, like if you're the kind of person that leaves jobs every three to five years, it um, the but the value as an employee is really um, back end, like back end loaded. So when in the mid nineties, when they offered people at Echo to switch from DB to DC, a lot of them liked the idea, hey, I can, I can actually choose what I invest in because the employer defines the contributions. And then um, they had a, a wide bucket of assets that the employee could choose from. So if they were more, you know, risk averse, they could make it more safe. And if they were more, you know, risky, they could um, they could take on uh, more equities or you know, more volatility within their portfolio. Um, also, if they were planning on leaving, um, that made perfect sense to them too. So in theory, um, this DB could have gone to all zero at that time if every single employee chose to switch to the D the DC uh, pension plan. That wasn't the case. I think I heard something that it was about 40, 60. Uh, so 40% of the employees at the time switched to the defined contribution plan. And so if you think about it, mid nineties, that is a long time ago now. Uh, there are still people that are alive. So people that were working and um, some people just retired actually. Um, or, you know, I know that like my mentor, he will be, um, or he's eligible to retire now. He's fairly like fairly young. He's in his fifties with a defined uh, benefit pension plan, and he's healthy. And you know, knock on, um, will will be a DB um, receiving recipient for a long, long time to go. So, yeah, unless it's like really a special agreement or a stop, and then like a hundred years in the future, uh, this thing's going to be kicking around for a while. Great question. Okay. So that also leads us to why would a company choose a DB versus a DC? Okay, well, this is a part, so we really talk about post-employment benefits. And so we really focus on the post-employment being the DB or the DC, defined benefit or defined contribution pension plan. But what we haven't talked about there is benefit. So we as, an, as a company, want people to come work with us and we want them to be working for us and working really hard so our company makes a lot of money. We've talked in previous classes, uh, IFA2 and those of you who took cost with me, that, you know, the good old Peter Drucker, what gets measured gets managed. And within that, we want to align performance incentives uh, consistent with that so that we have people working really, really hard and the same way as the company. So if we understand that as a company, it costs a lot of money to train somebody, a lot of like energy to train somebody, um, and we want them to stick around for a long while, well, a DBE pension, hey, come stay with us. You give us 30, 40 years of your life um, in a very same or similar role. Um, sure, there might be some progression. Um, and depending on the company, you know, um, they, it indicates that they value the fact that there is that, um, that is that matching of incentives. You stay with us. Um, that'll be better for the company or the organization organization. If I'm talking about, um, academia, 
or, and, and, you know, you stick around and then in 20, 30, 40 years, um, you will be taken care of until essentially, um, you are no longer here You need to be taken care, taken care of. Whereas to find contribution plan, a company might say, Hey, like we recognize it is the norm of industries in our position to provide a pension. So we will provide you um, a defined contribution pension plan and we will limit the risks of our, um, limit the financial risks of um, our company by making, by defining the contribution. So each company is choosing to mitigate risks and they've just chosen to mitigate different risks. So very broadly speaking, Somebody might choose DB pension plan as an employee because they want to reduce the employer um, to reduce the risk of employees, you know, leaving and um, and not and leaving with them the, their intellectual capital or their their just their knowledge base. Whereas in defined contribution, it is reducing the risks of volatility in the compensation that is provided and but still sticking to the norms of you know providing a pension. Guys, a company might choose to do none of these. And that's okay too, because this is all part of compensation. And in a market economy, um, you you get what you pay for pretty much. So if in that marketplace, if in that industry, uh, pensions are not commonplace, then there may be no incentive for an employer to provide a pension to attract the top talent, you know, um, or, um, there might be all the benefits in the world. So we talk about post-employment benefits. There's also employment benefits. Uh, so you'd be likely seeing this in Laura's tax class right now. What are types of employment benefits? Well, we got healthcare. We got, um, oh my goodness, we have stock options, which we've talked about here. We have um, some companies would have ping pong tables and food and, you know, oh my gosh, at, at EY, um, <laughs> during recruiting I remember going out for these lunches and like guys this is a while back and there was a bottle of water on the table and or sorry there were several um and each bottle I think cost like 17 dollars or like just something where I was like what is going on that's a benefit that lunch was a benefit let me tell you if the water is 17 dollars the steak was not cheap and neither was the beer that they bought us at lunch right like these are all benefits of being an employee um you know, fast forward to when the recession hit and we were doing smart spending, they kept um, some employee benefits. They did every other Friday where they brought in snacks and beer into the lunchroom um, at like four o'clock and um, you grabbed, you know, drink beverage, stood around like talking for a bit and lots of times you went back and, you know, finished off a bunch of emails or stuff on your Friday night, but it was a benefit. Like these are all benefits. And why would a company provide benefits? Well, um, to, you know, have happy, happy employees, to have employees that want to put a bigger output for the company so the company can make more money, right? It's not all like transactional is that, right? Like if I'm happy um, and, you know, I can find it intrinsically through, through purpose and meaning, or I can find it and or I can find it externally through, you know, goodies. And let me just tell you, I'm never upset if there are donuts in the lunchroom, right? So never a bad thing. Alrighty. So some people ask me pension worksheet during the video. So perfect. I have it up. And the next part was journal entries, summary or each individual. It, and then they, and then I love this. This person was like, or does it depend? <laughs> yes, it depends. So it depends on what does your user ask you? So what does your question ask you to do? So absolutely, it depends. Um, I do like having, <clears throat> if what you're asked to do is, oops, to provide, well, that's annoying. Um, if what you're asked to do uh, is to provide one, you know, what, what is the impact for the 2019 fiscal year? Then yeah, cool. Um, let's sum up all the stuff that happened throughout the year. One, uh, one sets of debits and credits and we're good to go. Make sure that we just add this up. Now, if we're wondering, hey, what is the impact of the past service cost uh, for, um, and they give you like a sentence, some case facts. Well, then what we're looking for is that impact for that one line. So really it comes back to reading that 
freaking question and uh, addressing the user's needs that way. So there isn't one kind of set item. I will say that if you are the kind of person that likes your routine and you wanna have something be the same every single time, um, do the chart, do the chart. Um, and then go back and reread the question and make sure um, that you are answering the question. So maybe you do the chart and you're like, sweet, it balances. Because remember, um, for the video, uh, we have like the two things that must always balance. And as long as we're there, we're like, okay, cool, that's correct. And then we're like, hey, what's that journal entry for the remeasurement of the DBO? Then you can go to your chart, go to your line, and then pull out your journal entry and answer the question. So great, great question. I like the strategy. Um, so kudos to you there. Okay. <laughs> ah. All right. I wanted to make sure I didn't miss that at the beginning. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Actuarial valuations, more than once per year. Sure, it, they could be. So they have to be at least once per year. Um, but if we have in if we have an indication as to um, significant changes in the marketplace um, and we have, you know, say interest rates just go wonky wonky or, um, or quite frankly, maybe um, the users, the shareholders want it or there's, there's some other purpose, we can absolutely have an actuarial valuation more than once per year. Absolutely. Um, these things are expensive. So uh, a few students here, so shout out, you know who you are, and I'm pretty sure you watched my videos, so thank you, um, like these optional debrief videos. Um, actuaries, they are not cheap, um, and it is not a quick process. So you'd really, as a company, if you're asking for um, one of these more than once per year, and as standard setters, if you're requiring them more, more than once per year, you really need to take a step back and saying, hey, is the cost worth the benefit? And, you know, if we're dealing with a whole um, slew of assumptions, are we going to really get more bang for our buck by doing this? Okay, last question here um, before I flip it to the CPA way um, question. What do actuarial pension plan financials look like? Oh my goodness. Um, we are going to, that is scope creep. That is beyond the scope of this course. That is beyond the scope of my expertise, um, my experience. They are ridiculously, ridiculously complicated with their own set of standards and like kudos um, to anybody that... <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can only imagine um, that is some very, very, very specific financial reporting um, knowledge and experience. So kudos to those people. All right. I'll see you in the CPA way. Um, chapter 19 debrief. All right. So in watching your questions uh and specifically the majority of the ones that did come from the cpa way i want to just take a moment and zoom out a little bit and i realize that approximately 75 percent of our students watch these debrief videos or at least that's how many um visits are so perhaps people watch them more than once i don't know i don't judge i can't tell um i don't have your ip addresses locked in for the youtube um did i just say the youtube i certainly did oh fun times all right uh but i'm bringing this up because uh, a few people during our mid mid uh, course survey said that they didn't see how the CPA way questions fit into the course. And likely, um, and I thought I addressed this in a previous video, and I think I did, but I don't know, I'd like to repeat myself a few times because I find that, you know, learning is repeated exposure to same or similar topics, including um, why something is beneficial. So the reason I had these as completion assignments is because I don't wish to be punitive, but I do wish to stretch you. Um, one of the students was um, at work at his co-op job and said that he had to submit a case, and this was in the first week of classes, and he's like, yeah, I have to submit a CPOA case. And the person was like, what? His manager was like, I mean, that's good. But like, man, it's first week of fourth year. That is no joke. No, it is no joke. Uh, the thing is, people, when I left university and even uh, at moments, uh, most moments, when I left um, my first, my articling job uh, when I was a CA, I didn't know what I knew. 
Um, so I'm really grateful that I had people around me to put in mechanisms in place to, and I don't want to say trick me to learn, but in a way, yeah, I had to focus on executing and doing my best, but I didn't always know how this would fit in, um, to other places. So if you are skeptical, oh, that's good. Absolutely. Question. And if I am not able to frame or communicate, I keep asking, email me, uh, book some kindly office hours. Happy to talk. I want you to know, um, cause I do put great care and attention into planning and then uh, great care and attention, uh, with our team into executing. So absolutely, absolutely. Um, I'm here for that. I'm here for you and to have that discussion. Um, people, in the real world, um, and even in uh, education world, things are going to be thrown at you, and you are smarter than you know you are. Um, one of the students asked, how can they do better at the CPA, CPA way completion assignments of these submissions? How can I best prepare? Taking notes from the get-go. So when you're doing your smart, smart book pre-work, you know, take notes. What are you struggling with? What do you know? Like just, you know, start summarizing your one page summaries for each chapter. That's the goal. If you go a little bit over, figure out what to cut out later. But I don't want you having to redo pre-work. I don't want you having to rewatch all the videos, maybe a few key things or maybe a few repetition, but keep your summary notes and keep adding to them. Next, the videos, same thing. You get an MCQ question wrong after just watching the video. Cool, why? It's fine if it's wrong. In fact, I'm going to link down below to another TED Talk. I don't know, two, two for one day, apparently, uh, for gamification. And yes, I know that there is a lot at stake here. This is real life, but we can play, we can play real life. We can do real life and we can gamify it and we can have that learning mindset. Um, and... And so what, what do I mean by that? I mean that, hey, look at this as an opportunity to take a summary of all the things that you've learned or could have learned and then start reading and start saying, okay, how can I problem solve this? How can I, like, what is a one, um, one or two, you know, main items here? Let's assess the situation. Um, if you, um, if your boss in, you know, you're at work and your boss is just yammering at you and sometimes you're just like, what do they even want? You know, being able to assess the situation, be able to identify problems, huge life skill, huge. Then, okay, cool. We have that problem narrowed down. What is our framework? How can we analyze this? Um, how do we, like, why is this an issue? Where are we going to start going? And then, Let's solve it. Let's use that framework. Let's solve it using our tools, our technical tools, and let's put it into action. Sometimes we don't have all the information we need, and we might need to state our summary or use uh, an assumption. Absolutely a okay. And then, because we are Dell Tigers, because we are not okay with just answering the problem at hand, um, something that I, I'm, I'm very proud of this. I've obviously mentioned this several times, uh, but the moment I was overpaid for my first invoice and I circled back to the person and I said, oh, I'm sorry. Like, I think you overpaid me. This very, very smart, um, and, uh, wealthy individual, uh, said, <laughs> I don't make mistakes. Um, I didn't overpay you. You earned every bit of that. Um, you talk to me, you are not condescending. You explain why you're doing things and I value your contribution to my business. And like, wow, I, I can promise you this. I did not do anything spectacular. But what I did do is I looked at the problem at hand and then I always tried my best to provide a little bit extra as far as insights. So, hey, what are the things that um, that maybe you should know or could know, but it doesn't appear that you do? And then how do we communicate that in an informative, non-condescending way? Listen, if everybody knew, like, all, how do I say this? Sometimes I would find myself at work because I'm not always like the best human, especially in my mind. And I'd be like, ugh. Why don't these people know what I know? And then, um, you know, somebody probably pointed it out or I had uh, this realization on my own that if everybody knew what I knew, they wouldn't need me. So how can I, and then I started like looking at it again, kind of like a game. Cool. How can I get done what I need to get done and then focus the rest of the time on things that I want to do? Uh, maybe it's things that I want to do uh, for the company. So I remember one company I did case writing. 
seminar for our CA and then our CPA articling students. Um, and that grew into a second seminar and a third seminar. And then it, it grew into um, me leading some items and also helping uh, our senior VP of the entire a conglomerate uh, with hiring and then going for lunch with them. And that was pretty cool that it was somebody, um, I don't even know how many levels ahead of me, um, but like all of the levels, basically all of the levels, at least like seven or eight. And like just talking to him like a like human and it helped shape the kind of uh, leader that I aspire to be, you know, um, treating everybody with respect and value and looking for skills. So, you know, and then other times, I, I did what I need to do for work, and then I focused on studying for my uh, accounting designation, All right? So anyways, and then other times I did what I had to do at work, and I, you know, worked a little slower and listened to a podcast. So, you know, here's, here's the real deal. Um, cool. Let's go through this bit by bit so I can explain a little bit more. Um, so I did, um, most the questions came from... Uh, really talking about where did this 9% come from? So I'm going to spend the next little bit on talking about why it is okay. Um, the 9% was a discount rate that was assumed in value. So some questions, a discount rate will be provided. And if it's provided, absolutely should be used. But in CPA and in CPA way questions, uh, this is not always the case. In this specific question, it is um, entirely acceptable and correct to assume a value for discount rate as the impact of the time value of money is considered essential to the question given the time horizon at play. So if you assumed a value, awesome. If you assume 9%, whoa, <laughs> get out of my head. Uh, but no, really, if you assumed anything kind of reasonable, well, it's reasonable. Well, let's, I, I don't really... It's hard to teach professional judgment, but I'll tell you what's not reasonable. 1%. 1%? That does not um, reflect uh, the time value of money. Um, that is not even, or maybe it is now the risk-free rate of return, but like that, that's not um, reflecting the fact um, like of a risk premium or, or anything that we've ever kind of seen in this course. Neither is 20%. Um, 20% is a good rate if you're talking about like a corporate tax rate, but we have not yet seen um, sort of an interest rate um, being used at 20%. So what would have been kind of quote unquote reasonable? I don't know, for anywhere from like 4 to 5% up to maybe 12, 13%. Um, yeah, so stick, stick above demonstrating competency. So knowing that it's going to be more than the risk-free rate of return, but less than, you know, small business tax rate of like 15%. And you're probably good to go. So assume a tax rate and understanding that if you had used two separate, um, if you'd used two separate values, that would have also been appropriate. Uh, so the discount rate on the net defined liability, so that one that led to the interest calculation, would be um, about the yield rate on high quality corporate bonds. So again, showing that it's not risk free rate of return, but it's a pretty stable one. Um, and for the remeasurement, that can be the difference in assumptions about expected return and the actual rate of return um, from that yield on corporate bonds. So due to real life imperfections and the fact that a corporate pension portfolio has a different set of components than the company's own corporate bonds, the actual rate of return that's earned is usually different um, from that of the um, the yield used on the uh, kind of the expected yield. So that difference between actual and expected creates the remeasurement gain or loss. Uh, so yeah. And if you had, again, assumed, I, I guess I just want to say that it's just important that you state your assumptions and that you're consistent. And that if you find CPA way questions um, confusing or you find them difficult because there's, you know, every like single thing I say is it depends or is it reasonable or is it supported? Um, that's, that's the point. And that's also the, why I made them as completion, right? Um, 
because it's important that you get practice in applying these so that you can take these out into the real world, whether or not you do accounting in CPA, do accounting in a master's, do accounting in your job, or don't do accounting at all. Um, people are not always um, <laughs> going to tell you what they need you to solve, and you're going to need some sort of framework progression to follow through. I once made uh, a decent amount of money speaking for exactly one hour on the CPA way uh, for, for a presentation that I gave to a private entity. And uh, I put it together with talking about um, going from two cars to one and using the CPA way to do that. So it's a framework. It's not just an accounting framework. It really is uh, something that you can use day to day. So with that, um, the questions didn't, beyond the 9%, didn't question how to go about um, these calculations. So I'm not going to spend time going through them here. Um, if you had wished you would have asked or are unsure, as I do feel like it lays out pretty well here. Um, when the question did ask, um, questions that were asked was why didn't, um, why didn't we use the, where are we here? Why didn't we use the chart like we saw in here? And the thing is, you absolutely can. So if you would um, appreciate using the chart instead of um, going through and, um, you know, kind of knowing, okay, what goes into that expense column? So this post-retirement benefit expense, what goes into this expense column? And you're unsure um, what, you know, you just want to go through the chart? Absolutely, go through the chart, then go back, and say, okay, what are my entries and calculation that needs to be followed? Give the entries at the end. It's about demonstrating competency. It's about addressing your users and their needs. If you need to take two or three steps, or not even need, if you want to take two or three steps, please do it. In fact, if this was me on a test and a CPA way question came up, I would be doing this all day, every day. Very, very rarely in senior level accounting courses do you get a closed system, meaning that there's only so many things that they can ask you. Here they are, people. Um, get really comfortable with how this chart works, that your net DBL, DBA is the sum of your uh, DBO and PA, and that all of the entries that happen throughout the year have to equal zero, debits and credits gotta equal zero, and that once they're all captured, that, um, that you're good to go, and you kinda only have to know what things, you know. Current service costs, okay, if we are paying people for, um, for pension that they earned in this year due to services that they provided and you know, work that they provided this year. Cool. That's going to increase our pension expense, hits our PL, just like if their regular salary. And that would increase the amount of our liability that we'll be paying out to them in the future, discounted back in today's dollars. Then our net DBL, DBA is the sum of these two. Cool. Debit, credit, equal. Bada bing, bada boom. Move on, move on, move on. So I would be doing this chart all day every day. And then if this chart came up and it was they only needed some of it or parts of it or one question, cool, I have it. I know it balances. I just have to go and get it. Uh, even better if it says ASPE because now I just know that I get to squish in my OCI with my pension expense. There's one less column. I love this chart. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Um, okay. The next question was about the... Um, can you, our auditors say that we'll have to, it was about the advice. So the advice here, again, this is to get you thinking, um, in CPA, it's conclude and advise. And typically, um, when you're going for competency with distinction, the, the advise is like the cherry on the top. This is what will get your invoices overpaid. This is the above and beyond. So we're also just looking for that demonstration of competency, that insight. What can you add to them? So when talking about why do we have to hire experts to, to determine valuation, um, what <laughs> don't we know how much we have to pay these tires once they retire? We do. We just don't know how long they're going to live or what interest rates will look like. Um, we have to, you know, figure out. We have to figure out that DBO, that's our best guess or our actuary's best guess of what that past, present, future obligation is going to be in today's dollars. And because there's assumptions, because assumptions essentially mean we're gonna get it wrong, we just have to get the least wrong or the most accurate based on the assumptions. So the quality of the assumptions will, will really drive uh, the ability for us to capture as accurately as possible to reflect that economic reality. 
Um, so <laughs> yeah, the amount in which the teachers will receive uh, like month to month is guaranteed, but <laughs> literally everything else, how many months they're going to receive it, um, you know, all of this kind of goes into play. All right. Thanks, guys. I'll see you back um, in just a moment. All right, and we are back. So that was just our CPA way question going through that 9%, uh, as well as can we break up that last journal entry into one or multiple? Absolutely. Uh, last thing, any more examples? So I would say absolutely. I released a post, a news post on in um, fairly recently. And if you wanna reread through that, um, I say right before I give you um, all of these, uh, please make sure that you feel confident um, and not overwhelmed. More is not always more. And if you are you know, satisfied enough with where you're at in the class, you know, please do not stress out and do all these. I put that they're extra because they are just that, extra, 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 extra. Okay, so the news post would have been from November 4th. This is when I made these. Okay. So if you want extra practice on pension, each, um, I'm gonna go to after the multiple choice true false. So what I did is I, well, I don't think that you guys need extra practice based on how this course was built. Um, the, basically all the weeks um, build up to help you prepare uh, for the exam and therefore at the same time, like win-win uh, with technical mastery. But um, for those of you who feel stressed out without doing more, this is here for you but I'm gonna still push you. The exams are 60 minute exams that you are given 80 minutes to write. As such, I have made each one of these equivalent to a 60 minute exam. So I would highly encourage you, even for the multiple choice questions uh, and true false, which won't occur on your exam, I'd encourage you to write these in 60 minutes because um, if you can do this and this and this and this in 60 minutes, then, you should feel um, more confident with being able to do the test in the 80 minutes. And perhaps you're like, Sam, I can't do that. That's too much. Cool. Do the first couple in 80 and then do 60. Or at least if you're only planning on doing a few of these, which is fine, it's not all or nothing, um, do at least one in 60 minutes and really push yourself. I think you'll be amazed at how well you can do. Okay, so coming back to the question, any more pension questions? Absolutely, each one of these has one pension, one EPS, and one uh, counting estimates and changes. So chapters 19, 20, and 21 in here. And each one of them are about 20, uh, 20 minutes. So sorry, and some questions might actually be two questions because it might be like two shorter questions put together, but all together will equal 60 minutes. Um, I particularly like, there's a few of these, um, that have a few um, like kind of list type questions where it would directly reflect this, this. Um, and it would kind of say, it would give you an item and then ask you, it does it increase or decrease or both? So, you know, for example, uh, where are we? A remeasurement gain or loss. This could be an increase or a decrease, right? So Anyways, I really like those because they're like quick fire, get you thinking and help you put together the entire picture again. And who knows, like I would probably draw out my, my little chart. It might feel like it takes more time, but if it's the same amount of time or a little bit more, but it gets you to the right answer, is that a bad thing? All right, thank you guys so much. I will see you in part two uh, for our chapter 20 EPS discussion. Hello and welcome to chapter 20's debrief, earnings per share. Alrighty, so I had a number of requests for the CPA way, the whole thing. By the way, if you're like, Sam, you seem like you're sitting on the edge of your chair. I am. Bambi is, um, is cuddled up right beside me. I'll put a picture of her <laughs> um, of where she all usually sits while I am working, um, except for when I'm working at my desk like this, recording videos. There she is, like right here. So anyways, without further ado, let's jump into the CPA way um, items. Okay, so Kevin here was asked, so um we first need to go through and determine what our individually dilutive instruments are. So things that could be PCS or potential common shares. And so things that weren't exercised throughout the year, uh, but could have been. So how bad, once we find out our earnings per share, what they actually were, 
Then our diluted earnings per share is like, how bad could these earnings have been? What is the worst case scenario? If everything that could have made earnings per share look worse, if those were exercised or converted or were made to happen. Okay, so when we go through here, we always start with basic EPS. So basic EPS can also sometimes equal dilutive EPS um, if, if everything is anti-dilutive, meaning if everything that could have happened throughout the year would have actually made, <laughs> would have actually saved um, the company money and actually increased their earnings per share, then the dilutive and the basic would be the same. Also, if there were no um, potential common share items throughout the year, that would also mean um, that that basic equals dilutive. So we always start off with basic EPS. And here we got our basic EPS is equal to $4.60 simply by taking our net income and um, minusing our dividends from preferred shares because we need to have our net income after our preferred share dividends or, or net income after dividends. Um, and then that gives us our 46,000 divided by 10,000 shares equals our $4.60. Okay, and that's because this is, oops, uh, that is because this is what actually happened uh, throughout the year. Okay, so now, and this keeps being a little tricky because these dividends on preferred shares, these are convertible preferred shares. And um, if these weren't convertible um, preferred shares, then this is the last that we would see them is here in EPS. But because they are convertible into two common shares, we see them as part of our PCS, our potential common shares, which we need to factor for our, uh, for our dilutive calculations or considerations. So here we have two items. Um, they, we were supposed to analyze them. So um, analyzing them could have meant um, if these were just preferred shares, um, maybe in the analysis, if they weren't convertible preferred shares, the uh, discussion would have been, you know, hey, um, these are not PCS because they're preferred shares and they're not convertible to common shares. Therefore, they do not impact, um, they're not PCS and they would not impact dilutive earnings per share. Cool. Um, but in this case, um, both of these are convertible into common shares, and then both of these could, um, but weren't, uh, during the year. So that means that they are PCS, potential common shares. Um, so we have to see if they had both been um, converted throughout the year, executed, um, how bad could earnings per share have looked? Now, I want you to take a step back. Earnings per share. The goal is, as an investor, as a stakeholder, as a shareholder, you want these as big as possible because that means for every share that you own, like $4.60, that's how much of this company's, you know, after tax, after dividend net income is yours. Amazing. So you want this as big as possible, right? So your basic EPS is $4.60. Now, the diluted is to try to make this look as bad as possible. So if everything that could have impacted this to make it go worse, smaller, happened, what would it have looked like? So now we go through and we figure out what is the PCS, potential common share, impact for these 7% convertible bonds. Well, we have to take that, we have to look at the numerator and the denominator effect. So had these bonds being converted, we wouldn't have to pay interest. Okay, so how much interest would we have saved? Well, these are $200,000 worth of bond, right? 200 bonds, um, $1,000 each, times by 7%. So we pay $14,000 in interest out. But interest is interest on debt, uh, and that is tax deductible. So we already had some tax savings of 25%. Right? So we only would have saved after tax a numerator impact of 10,500. Okay. And then these 200 bonds are convertible into 40 common shares. So that means that our denominator impact would be 8,000. So we would have saved 10,500 shares or dollars divided by 8,000 additional shares. 
and that is a mini EPS for our PCS of $1.31. Oh my goodness. This averaged into $4.60 would have drug it down. <sighs> would have drug it down. So we need to uh, take that into consideration. Absolutely. And we also need to now look, and I know I've said ranked most dilutive. I don't know that yet. I have to first look at what happened to my convertible preferred shares, and then I'll circle back and make these bold assumptions. Literally, these bold assumptions. But I'm bum bow. Here all week, guys, gals, peoples. Missed you. Not many people said that they missed me in the video, but I missed you. <laughs> um, don't worry. I'm not trying to look for I miss yous. Uh, it's been a fun time with you guys. Um, value our emails, our office hours, uh, you watching all these videos. Like, thank you. Okay. So 4% convertible, uh, cumulative preferred shares, 1,000 um, shares were issued, 4%. So, oh, that's where these dividends came from. Cool. So convertible shares, um, divid dividends that would have been avoided. So our numerator impact would be 4,000. We don't um, tax affect it because dividends are not tax deductible, okay? So we don't get to do that tax effect. And then it would have happened, it would have been, we have 2,000 shares and these are convertible into two common shares. So we would have saved 4,000 on the numerator. But then we would have had an additional 2,000 common shares. So that's $2 mini EPS for our PCS, potential common shares, of our convertible preferred shares. So now we look. Which one is worse? $1.31 or $2? Well, I just asked myself, what would I rather have? $2 or $1.31? I'd rather have $2, please. Therefore, $1.31 is worse. So it is most dilutive, and that one goes first. So we would recalculate this EPS, adding in the numerator effect of our, um, our worst case. So we would add in, we have 46,000 on the numerator here, 10,000 on the denominator here. We would add in our 10,500 to the top, our 8,000 here to the bottom, and recalculate EPS. And if that new EPS was higher than $2, we would do the same thing here. We would add in 4,000 to the 46,000 and the 10,500 to the numerator, then take our denominator, 10,000 plus 8,000 plus 2,000, and get our EPS. And as long as we keep on factoring things that are worse, then we get our diluted EPS. If we reach a case where factoring in the PCS, potential common shares, would increase EPS, then that would be referred to as being anti-dilutive, and that would not help us get to our worst case scenario, so we would not include it. Uh, the question didn't ask for that. Um, they just wanted you to, just wanted you to analyze it, so we don't, um, we don't provide what they didn't ask for. If you had it, you're not, you're never going to be negatively marked um, in CPA for including something uh, that wasn't asked. Uh, you may get negative marked if you contradict yourself. So you can't say something is both dilutive and anti-dilutive in the same sentence. Um, you can't say this is ranked most dilutive because it has a low, low CPS. This was ranked least dilutive because it has a low CPS. Like you can't play both sides. Um, but, you know, for the most part, um, you don't get negatively marked. And you, um, if you include something extra, it's not going to count against you. It would just take more time. Okay. So here, uh, the conclusion was asking you which one was most and which one was least. You're essentially just restating this, saying your what plus your why, and how um, and what I just said in the words. So when we would factor in these dilutive um, potential common shares. Okay, now this one came in. This one came in hot. So you guys were like, "Where are we talking about with these stock options?" Um. The company is going to issue stock options, and one of the other accounts tells us that they are always dilutive no matter what. What does she mean? Okay, so they're always going to be make it look worse because stock options have zero impact to your net income when talking about their PCS, their mini, um, their mini EPS. So when you issue stock options, 
Uh, I don't want to com complicate this, but if you think back to a previous chapter, when you issue stock options, that, you know, that black shoals, that valuation of those stock options and as they're earned, yes, those will be reflected in your employee employee's compensation and therefore impact your net income, but that would impact your net income for a basic EPS, okay? So when you have stock options, you have these things where the other side would be hanging out somewhere in our, um, in our contributed surplus. And you're like, hmm, they're not yet common shares, but they're hanging out there because they could be. So if these stock options are in the money, that means people could have executed them throughout the year. They could probably executed, exercised them uh, throughout the year. And that would have made your total earnings per share look worse. Why is that? Well, because it has zero net impact um, to net income when they are exercised, right? Somebody would pay their little bit of money to exercise the stock options. So say you can buy um, common shares at $3 and your stock is trading at $5. Um, the person would just pay you $3 to exercise them. That's a debit cash, credit um, the common shares, right? Because they get to, um, and you would also uh, debit uh, the amount um, that's in contributed surplus and credit common shares. But like this is not impacting any of it for net income, but it is in, in it is impacting, is increasing your denominator, which is your, your shares. So that's always going to make your earnings per share look worse. So if you have in the money stock options, those are always going to be dilutive. And that's what we are talking about here. So the thing on the bottom, the denominator gets bigger. Uh, the whole thing is going to be, uh, make it look worse because you now have the same amount of net income, but more people that could have owned those common shares. Okay, I'll see you back and we'll finish off this chapter. Thanks guys. All right, so we are back and we're gonna round out this video. Kudos to you all. This is when if I had an editor or good editing skills, we would have some confetti. Cool, we are here. All right, uh, came up again. Um, some of you beat yourselves up in these debrief questions. No, this is learning. Um, and unfortunately, learning doesn't always feel good because we have high hopes and dreams for ourselves, but that's part of the process. I will tell you that things that stick with me now, 10 years later, are the things that I did very poorly on the first time, but I stayed with it and I did it and I understood why I didn't get it right to begin with. And then they actually stick. Whereas the things that um, I got right away, I don't know. Sometimes they're there, sometimes they're not. So be kind to yourself. Remember, silly mistakes, they happen. Think about it as a game. And I know that's easy for me to say, um, but I really do think that um, with a little bit of time, uh, regardless of where you you know, end up in this class grade-wise, um, that's just one measure of what you know. Uh, but the empowerment and the initiative and the drive and the understanding that you take going forward, that's another indicator of, of this class and of the things that you learned. And I know. I'm not just saying this will be good for you or it's okay that it's tough. Um, I'm just saying it's um, based on feedback that I've heard from other students based on my own experience. Um, it's okay if it's hard and it's okay if it's not perfect. In fact, those are usually the things that are pretty cool later on to look back and reflect on. Okay, so some of you asked, how important is EPS for uh, current investors? Um, so it's one metric. It's one metric. I explained uh, that, you know, essentially the more earnings um, per individual share, kind of the more valuable um, your shares are. It's one indication. Other indications are current ratios. So how, how well is your company able to cover its current obligations with its, you know, current assets? So <laughs> how's our short-term health of the company? Debt to equity. How are we funding these things? How are we too heavy in debt, which is awesome because it's cheap and it doesn't call you at night. Um, or are we too heavy in, um, in equity? Uh, it's great because it doesn't need to be paid out, um, but those people call you at night. 
and they want future growth. How about EBITDA? You know, our base core earnings, how are we doing? What about our ability, times interest earned, uh, our ability to satisfy our debts? We have so many indicators. So EPS is a part of the story. Um, it's not the entire story. <laughs> Some of you just said convertible preferred shares. What, what the heck? I didn't see those coming. Nope. Um, so just think back to your chapter on complex financial instruments. <sighs> they didn't say easy financial instruments, just saying. All right, how to organize it, how to keep it all straight. You saw in the slides in the previous lecture videos for dilutive earnings per share, how we start with EPS and then we go through our, our five stages, uh, including the first one, which is EPS. Practice that a few times. Go back, um, do some extra, extra practice. Check out the tutorial videos with Bryce. Um, you know, if anything, I just know that it's nice to mix it up and hear somebody else talk about things for a while. Um, how do you keep it organized? It's funny because it's not about doing more practice or reviewing more things, although it certainly can hurt. But after, after you got down your base kind of core level of knowledge, it's about going back and debriefing, right? This is why we do our wrap-up videos. It's about looking at something that you didn't do perfect or that you feel looks disjointed, throwing on track changes, making those edits, and then seeing it. Now, okay, I think I haven't made a, a secret of this. I hated doing stuff like that when I was a student the first time. I hated like going back and redoing things. I'm like, what's the point? I just did it. It's done. No, no, no. The thing is, if we go back and we fix our mistakes or we uh, tidy things up or we make it feel more organized, that's cementing the knowledge. I cannot um, emphasize this enough. See? I'm using both hands. I'm that passionate about it. Um, that's cementing the knowledge. So that next time, um, it's just in your brain as like, oh, this is how I do this part. Oh, this is how I do this part. And yeah, it won't look exactly like the question that you had before, but your brain and what you know is a lot smarter than what you think you know. And it's in there. So, you know, doing the debrief, that's cementing it like the, the you know, the practice for next time and every little bit will get a little bit better a little bit better a little bit better and yeah you'll still need to debrief but then you'll be um you'll be so much further ahead and you'll be making different types of mistakes or and you'll also debrief and be like oh i caught that i wouldn't have caught that like last time so that's why i'm sneaky with the cpa way debrief questions when i'm like hey what's something good that you've done because you want to keep remembering that you're growing and you're learning um, cause when we don't reflect on this, sometimes our strengths become our weaknesses. And sometimes we just feel like we're constantly looking at the negative when you guys have come so far, you have come so friggin' far and I am proud of you. Thank you for your hard work. I love this. We have some very practical students. Why Waxo? Like, why do we have to do the weighted average for common shares outstanding. And why can't we just use the number at the end? Here's why. The short of it is people suck. Um, <laughs> now let me explain. So um, Peter Drucker, what gets measured gets managed. Back again, two times one video, go figure, Samantha. Uh, if we want to communicate to shareholders uh, what each one of their shares value is worth, we earned the income for net income over that entire year. We need to pair that with a metric that reflects the shares outstanding for the entire year. Because here's what I would do if I was senior management and there wasn't a rule against me doing this, right? Or here's what I'd be tempted to do. I want to make my shareholders nice and happy so that they don't phone me at night because that's what equity investors can do. They can be like, Sam, dear gosh, like make us more money. Um, and so what I would do if there wasn't that wax so requirement is at the, uh, like December 29th, I'd go buy back a bunch of shares. Um, and then on January 1st, I would issue a bunch of shares. Now, yes, there's logistics, um, probably going to cost me a pretty penny, um, you know, cause I'd be buying at a premium and selling at like a discount, but my incentives are to keep my shareholders happy with one of these optics, one of these um, indicators, pardon me, of EPS, so I could manipulate it, right? So why Waxo? Two reasons. It reflects the amount of shares outstanding for the entire year. Um, if we use Waxo, that 
would mean that we're looking at the amount of shares Samantha had outstanding for 363 days out of the year um, versus if we looked at just the year end, that's open to manipulation. Just remove the incentive, right? Um, I, I could do several other videos or discussions about this. Feel free to book some office hours uh, now or during your break. Um, but I'm happy to talk about the importance of pairing up um, appropriate incentives with what you're actually um, trying, the behavior um, that you're wanting to reflect. And the way that I just tend to think about this without thinking the worst about human nature is that Waxo reflects the amount of shares outstanding during the same period as a net income was earned. You gotta make sure the two economic realities um, reflect the same story. All right. So diluted over basic. Can diluted shares ever, diluted EPS ever be higher than basic? Nope. Um, diluted is the worst case scenario, whereas basic is what it is. So diluted can't ever be higher, but they could be the same as discussed in the CPA way part. Any activities companies may not want to engage in so that earnings can be as high as possible? Sure. Uh, so again, this is one indicator, earnings per share. Um, any act, so the question was essentially, are there any companies that public companies might not want to engage in so that earnings and therefore EPS could be as high as possible? Absolutely. Um, but, you know, <sighs> As a for-profit entity, you're always you're always balancing the short-term profitability and the long-term profitability of a company. Uh, one of the reasons why companies have stock options that vest over you know a number of years, why they have long-term DB pension plans, they want to keep people with the company and they want to keep people with the company that are motivated to make money or add as much value over the sustained period of time. So. High earnings now, sustained high earnings over that period of time. So, yeah, there's uh, lots of activities that companies might not want to engage in so that they don't reduce net earnings, so that they don't um, impact EPS. Um, if you had a specific question in mind, um, please uh, shoot me an email or um, put it in your next debrief video. Um, but absolutely, and I like where these thoughts are coming from because it's, it's going beyond the materials, which is going to like the why behind it and how can the story be reflected. And a number of you, I've seen this with leases, I've seen this um, with a number of the other topics as well, is like integrating items that you saw on your work terms or maybe items that you've seen in the news and um, bringing them home here. Thank you. Thank you for investing in yourselves, in your hard work. Um, thank you for an awesome term. Um, I am so Thrilled and honored and delighted to be working with you, to be developing materials for you. We are putting on the final final touches of the plan for, for next winter for AA2. And I am really excited and proud to, to show you guys what we have going on for that too. All right. I'll see a number of you in the huddle and in next week's debrief video. Have a good night.